Uh, Throughout our country's history, America has been a place where people have flocked to our country in search of a better deal. Uh, When the new world was discovered, you go back with me in history, when the new world was discovered, Europeans, they risked their lives in leaky boats, took a dangerous journey across the ocean as a chance for something better. The pilgrims wanted a better place to live, wanted a place where they were free of religious persecution, a place of opportunity, a place of blessing. And then a couple of centuries later, people from all over the world were coming to America. People from Mexico, people from Europe, from Asia, they all came looking for a place where they can worship freely, maybe escape problems and persecution happening in their country. America has become, we are, the melting pot of the world. And all those people have come for one reason. They wanted something better. They wanted a better deal, whether that was an opportunity to succeed financially, maybe to be free to worship God the way that they wanted to worship God. They've come to America for the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I agree, while our nation, I believe, is morally declining, I still would say that there's no other place that I would rather live today than here in the United States. I think we personally have the best deal in the modern world. But as great as the deal that you and I have here in America, this morning I would like to share a better, even better deal with you, a more important deal. As great as we have it here in America, everything you see around you is temporal, isn't it? It's not going to last forever. Your homes, your cars, all of our stuff, even this building right here we're in, it's not going to last forever. But the deal that I offer, or more importantly, God offers you today, is a permanent deal. This morning I want to talk about a way greater deal, something way better than anything you could ever have or even dream about right now. This morning I want to talk about the deal that Jesus offers us. A deal that makes all of my sins, all of my mistakes, Jesus says, and makes them white as snow. This morning we're continuing our series through the book of Hebrews. It's been a few weeks, but we're diving back into the book of Hebrews, going through a series titled Jesus is Greater. And this morning we're going to hit one of the main points of our book one of the key passages and it's hebrews chapter 8 we're going to be looking at the whole chapter but just reading a few verses here in a moment and over the last few weeks just to give you a little bit of a backdrop we've seen that jesus is better jesus is greater we've seen jesus greater than the angels we've seen jesus is greater than any person we've listed so many names greats if i you can use that word Throughout the Bible. And Jesus is greater than them all. We see that Jesus is greater not only than any person, not only than the angels. But he's also greater than any priest or any priesthood if you want to view it that way. And now we come to chapter 8 in the book of Hebrews where we see Jesus is greater than any covenant. He is the best covenant for you and me. Just like people come to America, they come to our country for a good deal. Today we're going to see that Jesus Christ is the best deal of all. Listen as I read our passage this morning. It's the first six verses. We're going to focus on the whole chapter, but I'm just going to read the first six verses of Hebrews chapter 8 this morning. It says this, Hebrews 8, 1 through 6. It says, now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Verse 3, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at the sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. It says, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, The ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant which he is mediator is superior to the old one. Since the new covenant is established on better promises. 
Now, let me take one minute and explain this word covenant to you. Maybe you know all about it more than me, or maybe you've never heard it before. But let me explain this term covenant to you. It's found throughout the Bible. Covenants are throughout the Bible. God made a covenant with Adam and Eve. God made a covenant with Noah, with David, and many others throughout the Bible. God makes covenants, or pacts, if you like that word better, with these men, some with these women. But the main covenant, the old covenant, found in the Old Testament was made with a man named Moses. It was given to him there on the mountain, which our passage talks about. There on the mountain of Sinai. It's also the same place where he gets the Ten Commandments, which, by the way, is part of the Old Covenant. And this Old Covenant is full of laws. Laws about how to dress, about how to eat, eating habits. Instructions for how to set up and how the tabernacle should look. For altars, how the altars should be set up, how they should be done. Order of the altars, and on and on it goes. It was basically a to-do list of laws that those early Christian followers would follow those laws. And that's how it was for thousands of years, but today. But you see, now this old covenant is obsolete. We aren't obligated to keep those laws. Why? Why isn't that we aren't reading and following those 600, some don't quote me, some of you may know the number, laws that are there. Why aren't we following them? Why? Because there's a new covenant, isn't there? Matthew chapter 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, a phrase is in all three of those passages that I use every time we have the Lord's Supper, every time we have communion, we stand, we hold a cup, and we say, this cup is the new covenant. And what does it say? In my blood. Not me, of course. My blood doesn't do anything but his does. In the blood of Jesus Christ, which is poured out for you. Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection fulfilled the requirements for the old law. Jesus himself fulfilled the requirements of that old covenant. And then he gave us a new covenant. A new covenant found in his love, his mercy, his grace. And this morning, we're going to use this old school term, covenant. And see three reasons why Jesus Christ is the better or the best covenant. We begin with the truth, number one, that through Jesus Christ, you and I experience inner transformation. Through Jesus, we experience transformation. Do you remember when you were little and you went to the grocery store with your mom or went to the grocery store with your dad? And if you were like me, Time, time to wake up, somebody. <laughs> somebody has their alarm set for, anyway. We'll wait, we'll wait. That's nice, though. Oh, Yvonne, I didn't know it was you. I'm sorry, Yvonne. That's okay, we'll wait, we'll wait. Take your time, take your time. The food's getting cold, but that's okay. Okay, like I was saying, <laughs> if you were at the grocery store with your mom, you're at the grocery store with her as a young child, and you get lost. Maybe it was just me, but this happened all the time. Maybe my mom was trying to tell me something, I don't know. Um, go over there, son. But, uh, and you get lost, so you start freaking out, right? So you start, you go to the left, looking down aisle, no, looking down the aisle, no, and each aisle you don't see your mother, you get more concerned, right? As a young four or five-year-old, you get more worried, more worried. Then you go to the right, you get more and more concerned. You're about to start crying. Your eyes are already filling up with tears. Where is mom? And then all of a sudden, maybe if you're like me, you just sit there at the end of one of the aisles, and then you see a shadow. And before you saw that shadow, all hope was lost. But then all of a sudden, you see the shadow. You're like, wait a minute. I know that shadow. That's my mom, and instantly your hope is up here. And she turns the corner, and it's her. You you give her a big hug, and it's like, Mom's here. But what was better? That moment when all hope was lost, but you saw the shadow of your mother. Or was it better when you saw her in all of her glory, if you want to use that phrase? You see, that's exactly what it was like for those Old Testament saints. You see, they they read about the coming king. The coming king, Jesus, the Messiah, is coming. Well, we look back. They look look forward. 
and worship God. And all of a sudden, Christmas, something we celebrated about a month ago, Christmas shows up. And it was Christmas happened. Christmas is when the shadows were replaced by the real thing. That shadow, the old covenant now, was fulfilled with the real thing, Jesus Christ. In verses 7 through 12 of our passage, we find the largest section of Old Testament scripture that is quoted in the New Testament. And we see here, it talks all about the fact that the Old Testament wasn't enough, is not sufficient enough to change us, to transform us from the inside. So now we see God gives us a better deal, a greater deal, a change, a chance to be changed from the inside out. Under the Old Covenant, under the Old Law was show, wasn't it? A lot of them, you, you talk, it talks a lot about, about show. People cared about what they looked like. It was all external. If you remember those so-called religious people, the Pharisees, the so-called teachers of the day, they looked really good on the outside, didn't they? They looked really good on the outside. They followed all the rules. But Jesus comes in, blasts them, doesn't he? He says, you're dead men walking. Comes in with a new covenant. He comes in with a new way of thinking. As he fulfilled that old covenant. It was only through, and it is only through Jesus Christ that you and I, people, can be transformed. Now when someone accepts Jesus when you did, or maybe in the future when you will, hopefully, accept Jesus Christ, you're saved. You receive the free gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't have a list of to-dos, do's and don'ts that we follow. We don't have to approach God through someone else like a priest. The old covenant is gone, and now Jesus Christ has come to transform us. It's a great preacher who just died a few years ago. His name was Adrian Rogers. He once said this. He said, the same Jesus who turned water into wine can transform your home, your life, your family, and your future says he is still jesus is still in the miracle working business and his business is the business of transformation through jesus christ we experience transformation secondly because of jesus christ we can be a child of god our passage hebrews chapter 8 starts out by saying the main point is this and the main point that he's trying to say the main point i am more importantly jesus is trying to say is that we have a great priest named jesus christ who mediates who stands between us and god to make us right with god he's not ordinary he's not weak he's not sinful he's not like any of those other priests we see in the old testament he's the son of god he's strong he's sinless he's eternal the new covenant is founded and based on the blood of Jesus Christ. It is permanent. It is personal. But I would like to go back to the Old Testament and to share a story. One of the books of the Bible, there's smaller books, there's minor prophets, and you skim through some of those names maybe you can't even pronounce. There's one in there called Hosea. Maybe you flip through it. Maybe you know the story. Maybe you don't. Hosea is a great example of how God sees us as his children. You see, Hosea was a young pastor. And this young pastor, he was bold. He would tell anybody. He would tell the wall. It didn't matter. He would tell everybody about Jesus. People that wanted to hear or people that didn't even want to hear. He was telling them about Jesus. Well, God one day went up to this passionate pastor named Hosea and said, I want you to marry that prostitute. Exactly. This prostitute. His wife now ran all over town, sleeping with every man in sight the entire time. The entire time, his now bride, his now wife is going around house to house. What do you think Hosea is doing? What do you think this husband is doing? The entire time, he's faithful the entire time he's loyal. He's a godly man who would follow after her. Who would take care of her. Despite of all of his pain as a husband. He still loved her. But we must ask the question, why? When you have to want to know like I do, why? Why would God want this great guy, this great godly guy to marry her? 
And you don't find the answer until you get to Hosea chapter 3, verse 1, and the Lord's talking. And he says, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. And then right here it says, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. And it ends with an exclamation point. You can hear God's voice, a passion coming out. Love her like I, like the Lord loves the Israelites. Don't you know what happened? The Israelites one day would be like, God, we love you. We love you. We worship you. And what happens two, three, four days later? They were so-called cheating, if you want to use that term on God, right? Oh, we love you. Thank you for helping us out of that horrible situation. But now that we somehow are stable in our life, we have stability, we don't need you now, God, right? Oh, we're fine now, God. You, You fixed the problem. We're good now. And something else would take that throne, take that top priority in their life until the next problem would come along. Then, oh God, we need you again. We need you again. And on and on. That would go for thousands of years. They were unfaithful to God. God was faithful. He was still there. What a great example Hosea gives us of the faithfulness of God. And how he loves us. He looks down and says, don't, I don't want you to do that. Loves us as a loving father would. A friend of mine has a daughter, and she keeps a daily journal every day. He was telling me every day she writes in her journal before she goes to bed. And one day she was drawing a picture, drew a picture of her dad. And then at the bottom, very carefully wrote his name and put their address on the bottom of the sheet. Well, before she went to bed, she showed it to him. So he's like, well, why, why would you draw a picture of me and put my name and address on the bottom? And she said, well, the reason I did that is because I have some friends who were telling me about this sickness. And it's a weird sickness called amnesia. And she said, if I ever forget who I am, don't miss this. She said, I want everybody to know who I belong to. Who do we belong to today? Through Jesus Christ, we can experience transformation because of jesus christ we can be a child of god and finally this morning in jesus christ we can be forgiven we were just singing about this this morning without forgiveness we don't have a relationship with god without forgiveness we have no chance of heaven our rebellion our waywardness our willful desires they make us unclean unapproachable our sin separates us from god And now, it's only through his forgiveness that we can be reconciled. We can be a child of God. And do you know what price was paid for you and me? The person walking outside right now, the price that was paid for him or her. Our pardon, our sinfulness cost us nothing less than the lifeblood of that ran through the veins of God's only son, Jesus Christ. I love what C.S. Lewis says about forgiveness. He says to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Think about that for a second. That's basically saying that God will remember as he, with forgiveness, God will remember our sin no more. Now, God does not have a bad memory god doesn't suffer with amnesia in genesis chapter 8 verse 1 it says god remembered noah now little kid you can be thinking oh no we forgot noah he's over there in a boat god's over here that's not what happened god knew where noah was he was there but so what does it mean does it mean that he left him by himself of course not by saying that he remembered him it means that god took action god acted on noah's behalf in the same way when it's god says i will remember your sins no more why because he has already taken action he's already acted on our behalf when jesus was on the cross paul says in second corinthians 5 21 he being god made him which is jesus who had no sin to be sin for 
us. Best news you'll ever hear in your life. And what does it say? So that in him, being Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. You, 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 me. We're sinners, right? We may be saved sinners, but we're still sinners. But now God sees us as the righteousness of God. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you, me, all those who accept this free gift of eternal salvation. We've been made whole. We've been made righteous. We've been forgiven. And since we have been forgiven, we can be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. We can be God's children. We can be who we were created to be. People in fellowship with God. People in fellowship with each other. Why? For his glory. And the author, I believe he's trying to encourage us here. He's been trying to encourage us to keep the faith. Stay strong in this dark world. I want you to take a second and go back and think about what those early Christians had to face. Their friends, their family, the people that were closest to them. People they probably shared maybe beds with, meals with for years. All of a sudden now they're kicked out of the synagogue, right? All of a sudden now they're kicked out of their home. The Roman government persecuting them. Believing in this new religion, this Jesus. So they start thinking, wouldn't it be so much easier just to go back to the faith of our fathers? Just to go back to Judaism. And so he's begging them. He's pleading, don't go back. The old covenant has been fulfilled through the cross. Jesus has fulfilled the law. He offers you, me, and them a better deal. But sadly, in today's world... Our culture today, pleasure, happiness is what really matters, right? The meaning of life is found in a never-ending pursuit of pleasure and things that make us happy. It can be sex, money, work, possessions, even innocent things like family. We grasp at whatever can give us temporary fulfillment. Our culture tells us we should be self-centered. We should have a sense of entitlement. We should never be content. Always wanting what's bitter, bigger. Always wanting what's better. But all it really does is give us temporary relief, right? And most of you know exactly what that's like. I mean, I can look at that list and tell you at least half of them I've struggled with. We've chased those pleasures, right? Now you can sit there and smile, but we all have. We've all chased those pleasures. We've tried this. We've tried that. But it isn't until you experience this better deal, until you understand fully what Christ offers you. It isn't until you experience eternal satisfaction when you finally realize how empty all of those other things and options the world gives you, how empty they really are. There's a lot of people out there desperately seeking more, something more, something permanent, something worthwhile, when all they have to look, they're looking everywhere, when all they have to look is right there. All they have to do is look to the cross. All they have to do is look to the one who died and rose again for them. All they have to do is look to the one who gave them the gift of their last breath, the gift of life. All they have to do is look to the creator and savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. The point Jesus is trying to make, the point the author is trying to make is this as we close. This better deal has nothing to do with the first person to get to. This isn't Black Friday when you, everybody runs into the store and be the first one to get a TV. That's not what this is. This isn't time sensitive. Well, somewhat. This offer is extended to everyone. This offer has the same terms, the same benefits, the same opportunities for all of us. It doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter what you haven't done. The offer, this better deal, is on the table for you and for me. So I ask you as we close, is today the day when you say, I will take that deal? Now, I like deal or no deal. You had to know that was coming up somewhere in here. <laughs> And I, I like, and I'm, I'm always the guy since it's not money. I'm like, risk it, risk it, right? 
But today, you better hit that button. The Bible doesn't say you're guaranteed tomorrow. Do you really want to wager, risk eternity in hell? Yeah, that's bold, but the Bible talks more about hell than heaven. Do you really want to risk that by waiting another day? Will today be the day that you say yes to Jesus? Let us close in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning. Father, what a privilege it is and just a joy to be back worshiping together and celebrating you, Father. Just so thankful to be just here with my family and celebrating the King of Kings. But Father, we understand that we are weak. We understand that we make mistakes. And I just pray if there's one person here that doesn't know you, that doesn't have a relationship with you, that they will say, today is the day, Father. Today is the day that I get my life right with God. Or maybe somebody in here is a Christian, but they've been just not living the life they should. They've been just walking through, not paying attention. Father, I pray maybe today is the day that someone says, God, I've I've been a child of yours, but I haven't been listening to you. God, I've been a child of yours, but I haven't been paying attention. Maybe today is the day that one of your own, Father, says it's time to get serious about you. As we have this time of invitation, I pray that you use this time to be glorified. It's not about us. It's all about you, Father. It's in your beautiful, it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.